Ladies and gentlemen, our next speaker is Dr. Eric Schmidt. He served as Google CEO from 2001 to 2011. Under his leadership, Google grew from a very small startup to a large global company. He served as the inaugural chairman of the Defense Innovation Board from 2016 to 2020. And in 2021, he founded the Special Competitive Studies Project with a clear mission to make recommendations to strengthen America's long-term competitiveness for a future where AI and other emerging technologies reshape our national security, economy, and society. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Dr. Eric Schmidt. I think we've got you on mute, sir. Perfect. Um, first, thank you for having me be here. I, uh, I'm in Seattle surrounded by boats, which I always think is excellent. Um, in the last decade, I've had a chance to work with people all throughout the services and the people in our national defense. And these are the best of America, uh, the men and women that serve our nation represented by you all. I just have an enormous amount of respect um, and for the people. Um, I do not, however, have any respect at all for the system that we take these brilliant people and put them in. So, um, so I will, let, let me start by saying uh, the people are incredible and the stuff that they make you all do is not. And so I've emerged as a person who is thinking about how to rethink the way we do our military strategy and innovation. So, so I got interested in it because, you know, I'd, I'm a computer scientist. I don't really know anything about the military when I started. And I now understand that we have a, a shrinking national advantage and that the, the time of my youth, your youth, our youth, um, we were sort of the dominant player, everyone else is sort of catching up. And in my view, we're not leading strong enough. We're still the strongest, but we're not leading in the ways that I care about. And that's my comment. And I think it's ha it has to do with a change in how national security and conflict will go going forward for the next, in my view, a thousand years, at least a hundred years longer than our lives together. And the doctrine that you all were raised on is basically hard power, soft power. <clears throat> and hard power is basically you do what I want or I'll shoot you. Um, sorry to simplify <laughs> many, many books on this. And soft power is the power of economics, influence, culture, and so forth, both of which are important and occasionally necessary. But what I concluded was that we miss something, which I call innovation power. And I got interested in this largely because every time I was in the Pentagon, the uh, government, some general or admiral would talk about near peer competitors. That's a phrase the military likes to use. And I decided I didn't agree with that. I, I thought that China was a peer, not a near peer. And the question was, why did I believe this? Because obviously it's a quarter of the military budget, although that's increasing. Um, they are not at a global Navy. Um, <clears throat> they're untested in battle since 1977 and so forth. But what I realized was that China was defining the platforms that I cared about and their strategy was to compete against my world and globally dominate. And that has enormous implications for America because our model has been innovation, growth, we invent new industries, and then eventually somebody else can make them cheaper, but we are the innovators in the world. And so, so to me, <clears throat> this global race of technological superiority with an increasingly powerful China is one that we actually have to win. And I think innovation power is how we, we do it. And I define innovation power as the ability to invent, adopt, and integrate new technologies. And I'm gonna argue that it's fundamental to our military hard power as developing and fielding advanced weapon systems will strengthen deterrence and if necessary, war winning capabilities. I'm gonna come back to Russia and Ukraine in a minute because I think you can understand that there are limits to deterrence. And in particular, we don't seem to have a good doctrine to deter 
an oil rich technocrat dictatorship, which is sort of one way to understand Russia. So in any case, the technological innovation then allows economic leverage and allows us to set global standards. And then we, with our democratic partners, and it's the usual suspects, that, so think about Japan and Australia, maybe India, certainly the Europeans, uh, Israel, and so forth. So to me, what we have to do is we have to organize ourselves around the way that we do best, which is the government and the private sector working together to invent stuff that's new. Um, and we are going to have to overcome the bureaucracy which our political leaders have managed to impose on the military uh, for all sorts of reasons in the last 70 years, because it's getting in the way. And the best example here is if you look at the impact of AI. So where are we in AI? Uh, largely invented in the US, on the west coast of the US, uh, in Quebec and in Britain, these technologies are moving the fastest I've ever seen. And you all are familiar with ChatGPT and GPT-4 and the other competitors. And the important thing is that the AI revolution is also at the same time an autonomy revolution, because it means that you can have devices that can think in, in a euphemistic way in a local context. And there are all sorts of issues with this. So um, one of the things that I worked on really hard is this question of human in the loop. And we concluded that as long as the human presses the button and causes it to happen in our recommendations, which the military was happy with, it was okay for the, for the weapon in this case to make its own decisions as to what it should do after it's launched, as long as they are legal and legitimate and planned. So there are all sorts of issues with this. And the problem, of course, is that inside the military, the adoption of AI is extremely slow. So I sit there and my, my friends say, well, what do you think about killer robots? And I said, we're not in the market to build killer robots because we're not moving fast enough. And I do that in, this, in a facetious way. I'm not suggesting we should have killer robots. But, but the reality is that our system is holding us back on something which we invented and we need to make sure that it works. I was just in China for a week with Dr. Kissinger, who's my close friend. He was treated like a God and we had access to all the top people in the country. And I would say that China is still between two and three years behind us. But they, because of the success of ChatGPT, which is, by the way, not available in China, just to the leaders. So that's wonderful. Uh, <clears throat> they understand the importance of this. And now they're putting an enormous amount of local, uh, local money into it. So again, the cycle begins. We're ahead and they're going to try to catch up. Now, I want us to stay ahead. You all do do as well. That's this innovation point. So the combination of AI, autonomy, and sensors will change the, the, the discussion about war. So to me, one of the things, if you think about the OODA loop, which everybody here understands really well, observe, oriented, decide, and act, is that AI will allow the OODA loop to go around much quicker. And speed matters in conflict, right? Boom, boom, boom. You, you, you don't have any time. And I'll, I'll talk about Ukraine in a minute. So the, the command and control systems that we, that we use that consistently rely on human decision makers could be beaten by a competitor that has a more autonomous decision making system, right? And again, we're nowhere near where, where we need to be, be to make these things happen. So I have never seen the level of innovation that we're seeing now in AI. And I mean, I've done this for 50 years. So this is ours to lose, right? We are the driving force here and I want us to organize it. So let me finish and maybe you'll have questions. I don't want to run, run too long on this. Um, <clears throat> I got interested in the question of how to win the war in Ukraine, uh, something which we all care a lot about. And I think what I, I understand military doctrine well now as a civilian. And when I saw the Russians carpet bombing uh, apartment complexes full of little old ladies and children with their 152 artilleries from a distance that are imprecise, I just, I couldn't take it. I, it was just too upsetting to me. I'm sure you had the same way, but literally I had an emotional reaction. Maybe this is because I, I spent so much time with you all and it just made me too upset. So I went to visit Ukraine. I'm going there this Sunday for my third visit. And I've been studying how do you use these principles to win in Ukraine? And after you, uh, the summary is, 
that you all are, we're all the Ukrainian army or Navy or whatever, and our commander says, we're gonna go, we have to get across a five kilometer dead zone. That dead zone has uh, tanks, uh, mines, uh, artillery, armed drones from Iran and so forth. Let's assume we managed to get across this, which I think is highly unlikely. When we get to the other side, there's some bunker. Uh, we use our hand grenade or what have you, and we get we kill the the opposition, and then the the Russian lines behind us bomb us, and we're all gone. So this is this is the definition of courage and or craziness, and we need a different solution, and that solution is drones. So I've now committed, and I can talk about this at some length. Um, about how we're going to win in Ukraine using drones, as a, and among other things, I think this will prove, you know, sorry to be so arrogant, but this will prove that innovation power, as opposed to traditional hard power, is how you win. So thank you very much, Adam. <clears throat> thank you, Dr. Schmidt. So I'll start off with some questions uh, for Dr. Schmidt, and then I'll turn it over to you, the audience, uh, for the next round of questions. So Dr. Schmidt, continuing uh, on your points about Ukraine and based on your visits there, uh, have, how have you seen drones changing the battlefield already? And how do you expect AI to change that into the future in terms of things like swarming uh, or operating in mass uh, with agency? So um, again, let's be really precise where they are right now. And uh, the folks here in the army, um, I didn't know this, but apparently the first thing that you learn in army is that when you have a defender who is locked in, in you know, trenches and well dug in, it takes three to five times more offense to displace the defense. And the military strategy, as I understand it, is to get them running backward. And it's very hard to shoot when you're running backward. So the core question is you've got um, a line and you've got everybody locked in you know, everyone is dug in, they've been digging in for eight years, so they have been doing a lot of digging. Um, how do you solve that problem? As I understand the uh, US doctrine and the Air Force and the Air Force folks can talk about this, um, it starts with air power. And what you do is you basically have to clean the, the path, if you will, of the opponent in order to get through, and then you carefully get through it and using techniques that you all understand. The Ukrainians don't have an effective Air Force. They have like, you know, something like 10, 10 jets or 20 jets, which is why they always want all these F-16s, but they just don't have them. So how do you solve that problem? You use drones. So after lots of discussion, and I should say about the Ukrainians that they were not prepared for this war and they should have been. And so everything I'm talking about is stuff that they've invented in the last 18 months. And I can talk about at some length how they got here. But the fact of the matter is, they've announced what they want and they want four different kinds of drones. And these are, these are precisely what they've said. This is the, their equivalent of the Pentagon. First, they want surveillance drones. These are long range, high altitude, high quality 4K cameras that loiter and observe. You need that because you need eyes in the sky. They don't have the satellites that the US has that we could use and I, uh, we may be helping them, but certainly in the battlefield, they need their own eyes and they need these. The second is that they need what are called FPV kamikaze drones. I had no idea what first person view stood for. And those of you who are my age, you probably have not heard it, but you're the people who serve, you're the, 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 the officers and enlisted people who work for you all understand that this is a sport. And what you do is you put goggles on and you fly these things around. And so the Ukrainians have built, and here are these numbers, $500 Chinese made, they assemble them themselves drones, which are kamikaze drones, which carry a 1.1 to 1.6 kilogram payload, which I'm told is enough to take out anything but a tank. And they put goggles on and they fly these things and they move so fast that you can't see them, right? There's no way to stop them except to jam. The, uh, the Russians have extremely good anti-jamming uh, systems. I was told, for example, that our high Mars are being jammed, that they fly. And then when they get near their, their descent, they're not even, they are capable of resisting some of the jamming, but you, you will know if that's true or not. So a complete denied communications environment. How do you solve it? You need frequency swapping uh, radios and so forth, which my team and others are working on. But anyway, think of these things as goggles with kamikaze drones that are one-time use, one kilogram. 
What can you do with a kilogram? A lot, it turns out. The, the, four, the third of the four is that they want what are they call bomber drones, which carry four to six tubes, which have larger than one kilogram. And they're largely to take out tanks. You basically get it over the tank and you take it out. You have to hit the tank in the right place, which is complicated, but you get the idea. And then the fourth, which I thought was in, unusually interesting, is slingshot launched, um, <clears throat> I, I'm going to say, I'm going to call them cruise missiles. So there's a company that I'm working with that for a list price of $26,000, $26,000, that's not with the military discount, can build a drone that goes 400 kilometers, carries 43 kilograms, and it has little itty bitty wings because you don't launch it, you, you basically rocket it out and it doesn't land, it just crashes. And it uses a points, uh, it uses essentially a INS system to tell it where it is. It doesn't even use GPS. You use those for things like artillery dumps and bridges and things like that. Maybe the Kremlin for all I know. <clears throat> I don't know what they're doing operationally. Those four are their answer to how they're gonna win the war. You can debate which ones, but they have announced that they are they have access to about 50,000 drones and they've said for this year, they want 250,000 such drones. So that gives you a sense of the scale of what they're doing. Um, when I looked at it and I'll summarize lots of meetings, um, it's really primitive stuff um, and that's where it's beauty is. So they have an arm chip, they don't have a GPU, they have a cheap FLIR camera and a cheap 4K camera, which they can get through the Chinese supply chain. And they put them together. The radios are inexpensive uh, and off they go. So what will happen is that at some point, they're going to figure out that you should swarm these things together. They haven't figured this out yet. Right. In other words, they're still busy with, you know, person, drone, target. And what will happen is that in the next year, they'll figure out how to do mesh networks where the drones can talk to each other. They can do terrain following to follow a moving tank. Let me give you an, or a target. Let me, let me give you an example of how clever they are. In America, the way you would build such a drone, and this indeed the way it's being done, is you'd put in a GPU and you'd have a very sophisticated image analysis group and it would be able to do 3D analysis. I can see it, I'm sure, I know it's a T-72, which by the way, are really loud. Um, you know, I'm going to go for it. I, I'm authenticated and so forth. They didn't do any of that. They take a CPU and they took a little bit of imaging software. They rewrote it to use a tiny amount of software. All it can do is see a moving box, but in a warfare, the only thing moving that's a box is something that you don't like and boom, off they go. So this focus on cost and speed is antithetical to the way the US government procurement system works. And that is what I think the most important thing for you all to know is that you, you are operating in, a, in a, the number of devices that you have is off by a factor of a thousand of what the Ukrainians would have in the same situation because our prices are too high. And that's what I'm impressed about is the cleverness. Uh, Dr. Schmidt, I'd like to, uh, you mentioned uh, the, some of the challenges we have in government. And during your time on the Defense Innovation Board, uh, working with Deputy Secretary of Defense Bob Work, um, uh, uh, you had some exposure to some of the Defense Department's challenges. Um, and recently, you sponsored an event honoring the late Secretary of Defense, Ash Carter, uh, called the Ash Carter Exchange on Innovation and National Security. Why was it so important to host such an event? And what do you think the impact on innovation and national security was? Well, Ash Carter um, was the person who got me interested in it. And he basically was very persuasive. And he said, look, you have to do this. And I said, like, why? And he said, well, do it for a year because I need your help and you'll enjoy it. And you, you have to do your national service anyway. And 10 years later, here I am. So he was transformational in my world. And, you know, I don't know about you all, but every once in a while, there's a person who changes your life. And he tragically died um, of some sort of heart problem uh, a year ago. So we wanted to honor him. But he was a physicist and he understood that all of the things that you all have been taught are not permanent, right? The technology and innovation change. And therefore, your tactics have to change. So we tried. Um, I've since learned that for the last 50 years, there's been a long list of people, including myself, 
who've attempted to change procurement and every attempt has failed. So, and there are all sorts of reasons for that. But <clears throat> the thought experiment I would offer you is, let's imagine that I had my own, and I'm not doing this, so please don't, please don't get upset. <laughs> imagine that I had a, a, my own private army, uh, which is apparently legal in Russia, <laughs> but not, not in the US. <laughs> and so I had my own private army and I'm aligned with the US military, but I'm gonna do it using the Google principles. So let's just think about what I would do. So the first thing is I'd say, I don't have $800 billion, right? So I have to do things less expensively. So I need, I need things on the water. So what I'm gonna do is take an old ship and turn it into my um, drone carrier. And I'm going to use that to force project into contested areas. I'm going to build naval drones that are on the surface or slightly below the surface. And for connectivity, because I don't have the, the military networks, I'm just gonna use Starlink, right? I'll just put the little dish on the top of the thing as it floats along. You sit there and you go, whose idea was this? Well, this is how the Ukrainians attacked at least two of the boats that they did. And then I would say, well, I wanna have my own military for, for the army. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to use um, drone uh, machine guns. And I'm going to do anti-aircraft stuff with drone anti-aircraft work and so forth. So once you realize that the priority is the inverse, in other words, it's people last, not first in harm's way, right? My, because I can't afford all the people and I certainly can't afford anyone to get killed, right? I'm going to put them in the, in the very end, very back of the system controlling on an autonomous defensive system. And that's gonna be the philosophy that I'm going to put in place. Now, I'm, again, that's a thought experiment. I'm not actually doing that. <clears throat> Understood. Uh, so during your time on the Defense Innovation Board, um, what, and you, you alluded to some of this already, but what surprised you about the challenges facing DOD when it comes to innovation, maintaining the competitive advantage and how do you think that will affect national security in the near and medium term? So, so I guess I was surprised by how tough the bureaucracy was to fight. Um, those of you in the, in the audience are familiar with the, the POM and the whole planning process. And uh, you know, the joke is we have an urgent net need, so we'll insert it into the POM process. The money shows up in two years. It'll take two years to plan it two more years to design the first one, which won't work. Once we then do the contest, we will actually do the awards to the contractors, but of course the loser will sue, which delays everything else another two years. So by then we'll start building them, but by then we'll, the cost will have gone to the point where we can only build 10 as opposed to, to the 200 that we needed. Um, this is how the major weapon systems work. And I think that if you look at the Air Force, the Air Force did a particularly good job with the new bomber because they used a different authority. If you look at SOF, um, they have different authorities. And I'm strongly in favor of giving our military leaders more autonomy with respect to making decisions. And what I've said, and I'll just be blunt, is you take these people, you train them you know, to the, to the, to the hill, you, they're four or five or six star generals, who knows, um, and you won't give them control over anything. You won't trust, you don't trust our military leaders to be able to make these decisions at a time of peace and war. It's crazy. So this is this problem of a bureaucracy that prevents progress. So what I would specifically do is I would specifically set some areas and try to do them differently. Um, I've looked at a couple, I think the one that is the most interesting is probably, it's gonna sound strange, is in um, missiles. Uh, we have a problem with missiles and missile defense. And we, once every year, we take some missile and we launch it and then we show the missile defense, it hits it. That's not how you innovate. The way you do is you have missile, 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 failure, failure, failure. Um, and then eventually you figure out how to deal with all the failure modes. So pick that one or pick something in the drones and that's what I would focus on. I think that the only way to change the system is to show people that there's a completely different model that works. Uh, in March, you published an article in the Atlantic Magazine, and uh, in it, you talked about the, the challenges of innovating during peacetime uh, versus innovating during war. 
Could you describe some of those challenges uh, from your point of view? Well, I, I've talked to a number of our military leaders and I've complained to them in my usual obnoxious way. And they've all said, Eric, you don't understand. We're at peacetime. If we were at wartime, it will be very different. And I said, how? I said, we'll have infinite money. Okay, but, and that's literally what they said. And I, I'm, I hope that that's true. If we're actually in a real war, the government will fully support our, our military in a real conflict. But I'm not sure that infinite money is the right answer. I think it's better to learn how to make hard and important choices, which is very difficult in a democracy, especially in a, an elected one where you know, some of these things are job programs and so forth, but simply take a tough line. So it seems to me that um, in peacetime, you have the time to get your formulation correct. And in peacetime, the doctrines are typically wrong. So I, what I'm trying to say in the clearest possible way is that the future will have extremely sophisticated military professionals and they'll be fought largely through autonomous means. And that is because we care an awful lot about the lives of our uh, soldiers and civilians. And also that autonomy with precision allows for zero collateral damage. Um, because I work in tech, I've been heavily criticized by my peers as pro-military. And they said, how can you possibly be in favor of these new systems and weapons? And I said, because if you're gonna have a military, you might as well have it be accurate, right? This goes back to my earlier comment about the Russians. Their doctrine for the 152s appears to be to take a box and they go boom, 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 you know, adjusting the little azimuth wheel in the artillery piece until they find something of interest and then they just kill it all. They, you know, it's, you, you destroy a city to save it, right? I just think that is a horrific military doctrine on their part. So I would like us to be so surgically precise. And I'll give you an example. Um, the snipers, the sniper systems that you all have invented, you have three snipers who have little green lights. And when the laser locks and the little green light happens, or whatever, it's, I guess it's a green light, they all press the button at the same time. And it's a guaranteed hit to the target that they're looking at, right? That's what we should aspire to. Right, because it's exactly, it's surgically precise, it's consistent with the law of war. And why can't we do the same thing with autonomy? We can, I and mean, I can go on. <clears throat> well, I'd like to transition the conversation uh, towards AI. You, you've alluded to some of the usefulness that you, uh, you see with, uh, for AI in the future. Um, in particular, uh, where do, we, do you expect we'll first see AI on the battlefield? Well, today, because of MAVEN, there are secret projects, which I'm obviously not going to discuss here, which use this technology for, uh, I'm just going to say vision. And the, the first and best use of AI is replacing a bored um, enlisted person who's watching a screen. Uh, my favorite example is I was in Bahrain, where we have a, a very large naval fleet, and we have I think three wooden minesweepers. They're wooden because the mine, I guess it's, it's, it's much better than, being, than um, steel for detection of a mine. And the young enlisted man is sitting there, a uh, sailor, excuse me, and was in front of a screen. And I said, well, tell me about your screen. He said, well, we've just upgraded it. And I said, what to? And I go, he goes, Windows XP. Yeah. And I said, well, that's 1998. That was a good one. Um, and as you know, Windows XP has been completely penetrated by our Chinese friends, but I didn't want to disappoint our sailors' pride. And I said, well, what do you do? And he said, I watch this screen looking for mines. And I said, okay, and how often do you do that? And he said, eight hours a day. And I said, okay. Now, this, what does it cost to train a, an officer or an enlisted person in the Navy? or in the military, it must be hundreds of thousands of dollars, uh, maybe a million dollars, I don't know. I mean, these are exquisitely trained people and the poor fellow is just watching for mines. And I asked his commander, what was his accuracy? And he says, he gets it wrong a third of the time. And I said, what? <laughs> so a third of the time you hit the mine? And he said, yeah. And I said, well, I don't think that's very good. 
And he goes, well, that's the best we can do, sir. You know, good military answer. So that shows you the, the, the craziness. And I'm not even going to talk about the LCS and its mind sweeping component, which is another disaster. Um, but the point here is that the whole doctrine is just wrong, right? That, that humans should not be watching things that are boring. Computers should be watching and they should alert you for, a, um, uh, for an exception. Maven started um, on the fifth floor of the Pentagon in a group that I had never heard of, and they had managed to get themselves an NVIDIA GPU cluster, and they used a piece of software called YOLO called You Only Look Once, and they traded, trained it on open source stuff like cars and trucks, and then they tr retrained it in the secret on the Cipernet um, on tanks and other kinds of appropriate military targets. That's a much better model. So the first use that any of you all will see of AI will be in automatic vision, you know, vision monitoring systems. And when you talk to admirals and generals, they've all been to the school where they said, here's what I want. I want a battlefield management system. I want the system to see all my sensors, all my shooters. I want it to calculate what to do and I want it to give me recommendations. We're not building that. Right? We don't have enough data. The systems, um, the systems in the military are just not ready for that. And they're always disappointed when I tell them that and then they get mad at me. But the fact of the matter is they've been saying the same thing for 10 years and it hasn't shown up. It's interesting that in Ukraine, I, I was embedded in the third assault brigade in Bakhmut, and, uh, which is very interesting because you know we're underground in the command centers and the bombs are going off in the left and right. Um, and the they're showing me their battlefield management system, which was generally known to be as Delta. And Delta can be understood as um, Google Maps with you know, uh, red and blue you know, symbols of where, and they, had, they mapped all of the Russian assets and all of the American assets. And I said, how impressive is Delta? And they go, that's not Delta. And I said, how are you not using Delta? They said, we didn't trust it we became convinced that there were Russian moles on the other side of the network. So we built our own for our own brigade. Can you imagine that in the US military? And what they did is they built this incredibly subtle system, which predicts where everything's going. And then the commander watches the little vectors and says, boom, boom, boom. It's an exact, exactly what you want from a battlefield management system. And I said, how many people did it take to build this? And he said, 10. How big is the brigade? 7,000 people, right? It's insane that the U.S. doesn't have the flexibility that our services, are in te te technically speaking, the COCOMs, um, don't have the ability to do this. And that's how you're going to get the sort of integrated battlefield management system. You're going to do it from the bottoms up by people who are in war and in conflict doing it. Um, and again, the, the scenario that I described in the U.S. would be seen as immoral, illegal, and somebody would sue you over it. It's crazy. So the, the audience is, is very familiar. Um, as you explain some of the tactical uses for AI, could you describe some of the more strategic uses where we may see AI, specifically with things like large language models, and how might those uh, challenge uh, the future of American security, uh, the, um, our ability to govern, and uh, to maintain a sense of community? No, very good question. Um, there's a for those of you who have time, I would read a paper uh, by DeepMind, which is a part of Google, on extreme risks. If you just type into Google DeepMind space extreme space risks, you'll see the paper, and it goes through an assessment of what what the real risks are. One of the things that it talks about is how do you feel if an AI system of the kind that we're talking about gets control of a military weapon system. Um, it also talks about adversarial attacks where your adversary could easily change the weights in these models and then cause them to fail or do the wrong thing and so forth. There are people working on this. But as a general statement, the, the first way in which you'll see AI will be in misinformation. So I'm reasonably convinced that 2024 is going to be a disaster for democracies simply because of social media. There are huge elections going on in India, obviously in the United States and so forth. And the online world is not ready for the deluge of fake, 
fake videos, fake uh, so forth. When I was running YouTube, I learned that a, that a video had enormous power compared to text. So in other words, if, if, you, if you produce a video that you, is false, and I say to each of every one of you, this video is false, and you watch the video, you'll still in your mind believe some of it is true, or you'll decide I was lying to you. There, it's an extremely powerful misinformation. And, and we, we, America, do not have a good answer to that. I've made various proposals. And frankly, I think this is a case where the social media companies are uh, uh, not doing the right thing. And if they don't do the right thing fairly quickly, I'm quite sure the US government will regulate them because of the dangers involved. That's a near-term risk. It, it is solvable, but it requires collective action, which is not occurring. The, the second one is in active cyber war. So the example I would use there is uh, there was a war. The war was North Korea attacked the United States, uh, the United States attacked back, and China thought it was a bad time to have a war, so it shut down the North Korean attack, and the U.S. stopped. And the entire war was one millisecond. And the reason that it's one millisecond is that's how fast these decisions got made. Um, and I think there's a lot of issues around zero day exploits um, using these things. I'll, I'll give you an example with an LLM. If I take a large language model and I say um, it's, it's called stepwise, it's a stepwise progression. And I go to the large language model, um, attack the country of France and tell me what you discover. And so you create a thousand bots and each of them attacks the country of France using what it knows and it may, gets in one way out of a thousand. So then you say to it, assuming that you got in, what do I do next? So this stepwise refinement of tasks can enable very systematic, and I, by the way, I like France, so please don't take it out of context, um, could, could actually create a genuine threat to a country because of this iterative nature of these things. And the, the way you solve that is you increase our um, cyber defense, which people are working on very hard right now. And the third one um, that is of great concern right now is biodefense. And the, the example would be with a large language model, you say, I want to create ricin and I want it to work this time. What is the first, what are the components I need to create ricin? And it answers that. And then you say to it, okay, now that I've purchased those components, how do I mix them? And you go, it tells you how to do that. And then eventually you say, well, how do I deliver it? And it describes the Japan subway attack. And then I say to it as a smart ass, excuse me, um, uh, why did it not work? And then it explains that the dosage was wrong and tells me the right dosage. This is chilling, completely chilling scenario. Now the large language models can do that, but the large language models have what are called guardrails, which don't allow you to ask that question. So it's super important that everyone understand that these large language models have information in, in it. Uh, an example is that I, I run an AI safety group of all the, again, the, the, all the, the various AI groups. We do it on Sundays. And so we had a, and this is, you know, this is the open AI, deep mind, all the inventors of this stuff. It's non, non-policy, just the technical people. We had a group come in and show us how, how or how much you could do if you don't have a PhD in biology, because the systems can educate you as a non-biologist how to build the biology. It can say how to mix stuff. It can tell you what titration looks like and so forth. So it's an accelerant for evil, and that's a problem. So I think those are, I think misinformation, cyber, and bio are the ones that are the ones that we should really be thinking about right now, um, and they're definitely coming. So that that's a fascinating discussion. Um, and, uh, you know, a particular concern is when AI advises us on warfare. Um, because in warfare, it demands that we disregard broadly held human values. And so how, what types of guardrails, what types of constraints uh, can help uh, with AI as we knowingly, as humans, disregard those human values and then AI is left to figure out how to act or react um, when those guardrails have been taken down? Well, this is an unsolved problem today. Um, there's a company called Anthropic, which invented something called a constitutional AI. And their idea was that you would, and you did the training, you would, in, you would teach it a constitution that would guarantee that it would behave according to the constitution. 
So the first is do no harm to humans, you know, the usual, the usual kinds of things. Um, the problem that we have is that the, it is now understood that you can train with the constitution. And then if you're sufficiently evil enough, which I would certainly assume the North Koreans and the Chinese could be, you can take all of those constitutional things out and allow it to become evil. So we, we do not today have a solution to this problem that I'm comfortable with. And I think this is the biggest proliferation question that we have. And there's a further, not to scare everybody, but there has been a, a belief in my industry for this year that the frontier models, which are the big four, which are OpenAI, Microsoft, Inflection, and um, sorry, Google and um, Anthropic, um, they will be heavily regulated. They're not going to do open source. They all have very sophisticated groups working on these guardrails. So I figured it would be okay. But the open source movement, uh, exemplified by Llama 2, which just came out from Facebook, is moving so quickly and the hardware is getting so cheap that it may be that we have a severe proliferation problem of these evil tools quicker than I had thought. And I, I say that having... I sort of come to this view in the last month, and I don't think the industry's quite figured out how to deal with it. Well, so I'd like to transition to something that you said at the beginning of your talk, uh, and I'd like to get into soft power. Uh, Dr. Schmidt, I am a military veteran of 24 years. I and many of the people in this audience have dedicated and devoted our adult lives to generating hard power for the United States. I firmly believe that America's strength resides in its soft power. How can innovative technology help the U.S. generate and project soft power? Well, you know, I am a good example of success with soft power because Google is a global brand with American values, which drives the other countries crazy because we, we built Google with American values, American tolerance, American liberalism, uh, our treatment of women and of uh, gay rights and all of these kinds of things that are offensive in other countries. Well, America is proud of our liberalism and our democracy. And other countries view that as hegemony. They, they believe that we are invading their country with our online stuff. And I would, of course, say, well, if you don't like it, you can block us. <laughs> Unfortunately, China actually did that. It's a separate discussion. Um, so... I think that the, the truth is you're always going to have hard power and soft power in your framing, but the way hard power will be, what happens is when everybody has the kind of hard power that America has, we're going to have to change it again. And that's what I mean by innovation power. Okay. Well, thank you. So at this point, I'd like to turn it over to our audience. I'll keep the current format. So I'll go quadrant by quadrant. And again, please stand up, use the microphone, press and hold the button, and we're ready for your questions. Yes, in the blue shirt. Good morning, I'm Trevor, I'm in the Navy. Could you speak a little bit about machine learning in a defense environment where the truth data or the, isn't readily available? So a general rule about AI is the quality is a function of the quality of the data and the length of training. And the way the models that you're seeing are emerging is people spend many months assembling all the data and curating it. Um, and there are all sorts of open source databases and so forth of that range. The military doesn't have any of that. So, I think it's unlikely the military will do a very good job of the more strategic stuff, you know, the sort of complicated reasoning questions that humans do today without more data. The um, uh, one way to understand it is when you approach a hard problem, the first thing you would do is have the large language model read all of the doctrine. So it can actually just read and it's called fine tuning and you would teach it military doctrine. But if you want to ask it any interesting question, it needs facts like um, how many people are in the Pacific theater? How many ships do we have? Where are they? And we don't have that data organized in a single place so that the system can consume it and use it for reasoning. And that's why the battlefield management strategic com conversation, which everyone wants, 
is going to be so difficult to get. Okay, more questions from the audience. Yes, here in the front. Hello, good morning. I'm Rick Becker. I'm from the U.S. Army. Um, when we talk about combined joint all-domain command and control and trying to get uh, commanders to have as much information available to make decisions, a lot of that is dependent on having the right talent. And so, you know, I think one of our challenges that I'd ask your opinion on is how can the Department of Defense compete for that talent when one data scientist commands 350K a year on the outside and we probably need like 100 of them, right? But that's, that's a huge exactly. part of the budget. Thank you. So I thought I agreed with the premise of your question, but then I learned that there's an awful lot of Americans who want to serve our nation and they want to work on interesting things and they're willing to take low salaries to do it. So here's the problem. We bring those people into the service or as civilians and then we give them boring things to do. So I'll give an example. I was at the um, uh, NSA, so never, which stands for N never say anything, right? And the, we have a, we're, we're in a secret meeting on Russia and you have this brilliant young man. I don't know what his rank was, but he was a doing um, cyber analysis for a, a Russian attack, which I don't remember the details of. And so I, of course, said, well, how are you? You know, I'm so impressed with you. And I said, what are you going to do next? And he said, well, I'm going to leave. And I said, why are you going to leave? Because he said, my next assignment is the equivalent of guard duty over in this other post. So here you've got a person who is extraordinarily valuable, who because of the HR system in the military has to get promoted by going and doing something that he doesn't want to do. Now, we don't do that with the doctors. You don't take the doctors and the, the nurses in the military who are in uniform and serving us, and you don't say, oh, you have to go command a tank for a while. You know, we understand that. So there's this weird problem in the bureaucracy where it's, it doesn't value technical skills as a career path, and that's why the people are leaving. And by the way, every one of those people who leaves, I hire because they're so good, right? <laughs> They're that good. And it's a tragedy that the military is losing them. And it's, it's your own fault in the sense that your HR system and your, the way you get promoted, you promote generalists. Well, innovation requires specialists. Right? I, I, for example, I was the CEO of a company and I have a PhD in computer science, right? It's very rare that you, in the military, you'd have somebody who has a PhD who's also in a command position, right? Maybe, that's, maybe I'm a bad commander, but the, the important point is the system has produced generalists, but you need, as, our, as let's say you're the commander, you're the admiral, uh, or in your case, the general, you want to be, you want to have specialists working for you. You don't want generalists, you want the specialists. Like, you know, you understand this, go solve this problem, right? So it's, it's this, oh, it's a lack of understanding of the need for specialization. All right. How about here from the left side of the auditorium? Yes, in the back. Good morning. My name is Taylor Haggerty, United States Navy. I found it particularly interesting in your article um, how you discussed China using like, public and private partnerships as well as the civil military fusions. Um, and, and so obviously that's been a great benefit to them. And so what are some of the hurdles in the United States with us um, modeling that for our benefit and what does that practically look like for us? I don't, th a very good question, thank you. Um, I, I think it's unlikely we can do it in the US for all sorts of cultural reasons. The way they work is they have brutal commercial competition. And when I say brutal, I mean, they work much harder than, than we do. And we, we think we work, we work much harder than anyone else. Um, and that brutal competition produces national champions. And then they pour money into the national champions. That would be roughly the equivalent of handing billions of dollars to Apple and Google and Microsoft, which is just not going to happen in the U.S. for all sorts of, of good reasons. So their model produces national champions, which then have military, military parts um, I went to um, the group that does surveillance uh, before COVID 
and they showed me all of their tracking systems and surveillance of citizens, how they track cars, very impressive technology. They're the leader in surveillance. I'm not sure we want to be, but they were. But they didn't show me the building next door, which must be where they're building all of the systems that oppress Uyghurs, right? So in other words, you have to assume there's two buildings and I got to see one and there's another one right next door full of military stuff. They don't have the boundaries. They don't have the primes that we have in America. And I think that allows them to move quicker. What I, one of the things that I hope, it's gonna sound terrible and I apologize, is I hope that one of the positive consequences of the terrible war of Ukraine is that the tech sector will understand that there is evil in the world and that we in the tech industry have to support you in innovation. And I've, I've set my own agenda around that. We'll see if, if it actually works or if the tech people are just sufficiently stupid that they just don't see it. I think we have time for two more questions. Yes, here in the front. Good morning, sir. Lieutenant Commander Harris from the Navy. I was curious, um, well, one, thank you for the work you do in your patriotism. But the I'm not sure if you're familiar with the book, The Kill Chain, but the author kind of talks about the history of the DOD and, you know, Silicon Valley tech sector relationship and how that's attributed a lot of success in the early 20th century. And we saw a degradation of that relationship in the late 20th century and into the early 21st. I think you said a couple of things that intrigue me that hint towards it a little bit, but I was curious if that, uh, stress relationship is something you experienced in your career and if that's something you see that's on the mend and how that plays into our future success of innovation um i think it's getting better um strangely when the maven decision was made at google i was dual hatted i was military and google and i was the chairman of google and i was not allowed in to participate for good legal reasons in a decision for google to cancel a contract with the military which in my view was a terrible mistake. I've said this publicly, I'm not saying anything that people don't already know. Uh, I think we should be supporting the national security of the country that, we, that we're citizens of and we work in. I mean, thank God for America. Um, so what I think is true now is that even Google has realized that it, was, it made a terrible mistake, um, which I would have told them that had I been allowed to speak to them. And even now Google is trying to work with uh, the US military in its enterprise products and so forth and so on. So I think it's getting better. The core problem is the following, and Ash Carter tried to fix this. I've got 50 startups that I know because everybody talks to me and they're really smart and they all are stuck in the valley of death. They've all built a product. It's really interesting. It would be really helpful to you. And there's no one to call on in the Pentagon who's their friend. They are required to go through procurements. Well, they don't have enough money to do that. They have to adhere to all of these strange rules, which are unique to the military, which they either don't understand or they don't have time to get into. And yet they're building the equivalent of swarming drones or very specialized military targeting or things that you really want. And so various people have tried to bridge that problem. Ellen Lord, when she was running um, uh, acquisition under Trump, um, tried really hard to do this. The current gener current leadership is different, still trying to do the same thing. Um, it remains an unsolved problem. So, so I think at this point, the, the answer is there is willingness, but the path is still of poor quality. Okay. Uh, yes, in the center there. Uh, David Jordan, Army. Sir, you talk about uh, a battle of systems and innovation power, and specifically... What would you change about our systems and processes so we can get those pragmatic solutions to the warfighter today while allowing continuous iteration and experimentation to eventually achieve an exquisite capability? So I think there's multiple paths. The one I like the most is let the people commanding the warfighters do what they want. When I got to Ukraine, there are 120 brigades and I realized that they're all run slightly differently. Right, of course, the war is new. So they didn't have time to put in a bureaucracy. I'm sure they're planning on it. Plus, there's a lot of history of corruption in Ukraine anyway. So God knows, maybe that'll happen too. But at the moment, it looks like a whole bunch of entrepreneur, uh, entrepreneurial groups trying to figure out how to win. 
why can't we do that in the U.S.? Why we can't we empower our uh, military leadership to, to to make these decisions? If I were a military leader, which I don't think I have the courage to be, based on what I've seen in war, uh, I would immediately say I want a hundred engineers and I want them to do whatever I want them to do, and I want them to fix this, fix this, fix this, fix this, and I want there to be a very straight, uh, the quickest possible path. You've got a problem; it gets fixed by the engineer. That would so improve your daily life, whether it's the HR system, the procurement system, the military billet system, the housing, the house move system. There's all these sorts of things, the targeting systems and so forth. So that's the first thing I would do. The second thing that I would do, um, which again, these are ideas. And Chris, when he wrote the book that you're describing, talks a little bit about this. His idea was to have a competition where we actually had real a, a, a real competition between two systems. So I'll give you, going back to my fake example of my own military. So we want to build an aircraft carrier. And aircraft carriers, as you know, are highly, highly vulnerable to um, hypersonic missiles. So what's an alternative way to get force power with an aircraft carrier that is more resilient to hypersonic systems? Let's do a trial and see and compete idea A against idea B. We don't do that. We do this sort of centralized planning. It's sort of like Soviet style where we sort of decide and then we sort of wait and then we have like 15 years, right? I'd much rather have competition today. That's what I'm used to and let the best ideas win, right? The people are good. They're, they're prevented from doing things which are which are, allow them to compete and learn whether things work or not. Well, so that's all the time we have for questions. Dr. Schmidt, uh, any final comments? Well, I want to begin by saying that part of the reason that you all are here is that you are literally the best and the brightest in our military. And um, it's an honor to, to work with you. Um, I admire your service. I, as I said, I don't think I have the courage to do what you do, but I want to help. And I think that I would encourage you to question the doctrine of innovation and the ways in which you've been brought up, because I think that there is a better way. And I think your future career will be determined to some degree by how you can see, how you can seize the power, the structure, if you will, um, that you have control over to innovate in the space that you can control. Innovation is how you're going to win. It's how you're going to get promoted. It's how you're going to end up becoming the big cheese that everybody wants you to be. So with that, thank you so much for, for listening to me pontificate on this. And um, thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Dr. Schmidt.